energy paper one higher. Figure one shows four different types of cell. Which cell is a plant cell? Give one reason for your answer. Cell D is a plant cell. This is because it either has chloroplasts or has a large vacuole. So you get one of these reasons and then D gets you one mark as well. Which cell is an animal cell? Cell B is an animal cell because it doesn't have a cell wall. Which cell is a prokaryotic cell? Cell C because there is no genetic material inside a nucleus or if you'd have said no nucleus that's absolutely fine. A scientist observed a cell using an electron microscope. The size of the image was 25 millimetres. We've got to calculate the real size of the cell. Now we've got to do this in micrometers. So remember what I said to you before, easier to convert first. So 25 millimetres into micrometers is 25,000. Using our equation, A equals I divided by M. Our image size is 25,000. Our magnification is 100,000 and you get 0 0.25 micrometers. If you'd have left this as millimetres that would have knocked you off one mark. So the marks go as follows. One mark for the conversion, one mark for the working and one mark for the correct answer. So if you don't convert you drop one mark. Plants absorb light by photosynthesis. Tick the correct equation. Be really careful that you get this right. It's that last one. Now, the rate of photosynthesis in the pondweed is affected by different colours of light. Describe a method you should use to investigate this. What you should, you should include what you should measure, that's your um, dependent variable, and also the variables that you'd like to control. Now there are certain ways that we set out method answers, I'll make it really easy for you. For a six mark question you don't actually have to write that much if you look at my mark answer, there we go. So I've got an ex a section that says what my independent variable is. <clears throat> it doesn't directly ask you for that, but You've got to show them how you're changing what you're changing. Now, in this case, we're changing the colour of light and all you have to do is use a coloured filter on the front of a lamp. Now, a coloured filter is just a clear transparency or a coloured transparency uh, that will let certain colours of light through. OK, so that's you've told them exactly how you're going to do that. Your dependent variable, I'd always lay it out like this. OK, I'm going to just quite simply count the number of bubbles produced in a minute, one or two minutes. Uh, you could have said I would have collected the volume of gas produced in one or two minutes, but you've got to make sure it's a rate, which is why you have to imply that you're doing it in a certain amount of time. Then I do my control variables. I'm going to control the temperature of the water using a water bath. I'm going to control the supply of carbon dioxide using two scoops of soda lime. I'm going to control the light intensity, not the colour, because that's what I'm changing. And I'm going to do that by placing the lamp 50 centimetres away each time. So already I've covered the bits that they want me to cover here. But what I haven't done is described a method. So here is my method. It should never be longer than four or five steps. OK, they've given you a picture. OK, and you, you can just say, Shut up, set up the equipment as shown in the diagram. I then need to place my lamp. Uh, initially, I'm going to use no filter 50 centimetres away from the lamp. And I'm going to use a ruler to measure that. 
sounds really obvious, but do write things like this in because they want to know how you're taking your measurements. I'm going to let the pondweed settle or acclimatise for two minutes. Then I'm going to count the number of bubbles released in two minutes. And I might do this a further three times so that I can take a mean. Easy, really simple method. Then all I have to do to get my extra level to get up into that top bracket is to say, I'm going to do this whole thing again, but repeat steps one to four using different filters. Okay. And then of course, each time you'll take a mean and you can make your comparisons. So girls, every time you do a method, we've talked about this before, I want you to follow these stages. Okay, a student carried out a similar investigation himself. The scientist said, light stops being a limiting factor at a light intensity of 20 units. Give the evidence. So if we go up to 20 arbitrary units here, the evidence is that the line does not continue going straight up. Okay, so the rate of photosynthesis does not increase beyond 20 units. That's our evidence. What could be limiting the rate of photosynthesis as the light intensity increases after this point? It's not going to be light, so it could be CO2, one mark, or it could be temperature, one mark. So just pick one. So question number three. Amylase is an enzyme that digests starch. A student investigated the effect of pH on the activity of amylase. This is the method he used. Mix the amylase and the starch suspension. Put the boiling tube into a water bath. Remove a drop of the mixture every 30 seconds and test it for the presence of starch. Repeat using different pH values. So in this table, we've got basically how long it took the starch to be broken down into sugar. So the amylase is going to break the starch into sugar. So that's how we know the reaction has taken place. You're putting that amylase in different pHs. So the quicker it took, the faster the enzyme was working. Okay, so let's have a look at the questions. Question 3.1. The student concluded that pH 7.25 was the optimum pH for the amylase enzyme. This is not a valid conclusion. Suggest why. So looking back at the table, he's absolutely right. Between these two values, 7 and 7.5, is definitely the optimum value because it took less time for that starch to be broken into sugar. However, he hasn't tested any of those values, so it could be any value between 7 and 7.5 as they've got the same results. And also, he hasn't done any repeats. That's a limit to his investigation. The student did another investigation. This is the method he used. He put amylase solution and starch suspension into a boiling tube. He made the pH 7.25. He put the boiling tube into the water bath at 25 degrees. And this time he measured the amount of sugar produced every 30 seconds. So the first thing you've got to do is calculate the mean rate of sugar produced per minute in the first five minutes. So if we go back to our graph, five minutes, I always draw my extrapolation lines on, and you, sometimes you get marked for this, so please do it if you can, okay? I notice that 2.7 units of sugar is made in five minutes. Okay, so 2.7 units made over 5 minutes, which means that if I want it per minute, I do 2.7 divided by 5. That will give me one mark. Getting my answer gives me another mark. Okay, the answer is 0 0.54.
Iodine solution is added, question 3.3. Iodine solution is added to a sample taken from the boiling tube after 10 minutes and after 60 minutes. So we're looking at the solution after 10 minutes. I've suggested it goes black. If you look at this graph, that's simply because there's still quite a lot of starch there. It hasn't all been turned into sugar. However, after 60 minutes, I've suggested uh, that the iodine doesn't go black. It actually stays the same colour, which you know to be orange. Why? Because sugar is made at that point. You can tell on the graph as it goes up. OK, question 3.4. The scientists repeated the investigation at 37 degrees C. Draw a line on figure 11 to show the predicted results. Now, at 37, that's actually a higher temperature than his original 25, which you were told right at the beginning up here. So hopefully you've all decided the amylase would be broken down faster. So you've got a steeper line there. That's one mark. But it's not going to make any more sugar because, of course, uh, you can only break down the starch that is there. You can't make any more. So it's going to plateau at the same point, exactly the same point. So that's your second mark there. OK, question 3.5. The same investigation was repeated at 65 degrees C. How would this affect his results? So at 65 degrees C, alarm bell should be ringing because the enzyme should be denatured. So how would this affect the results? There would be no sugar produced from the starch, one mark, because at 75 degrees C, the enzyme will be denatured. That's another mark there. OK, so here's the third mark. It will no longer fit the starch and break it down. If you remember an enzyme that once looked like, looked like that, say, uh, might look like this. So its active site is no longer able to uh, allow starch in. Okay, and that's a bit of a problem because obviously then it's not going to work properly.